mistakes would be to really read the Constitution, follow the Constitution, not step over it, and let the Congress be the person who makes the decisions with you instead of taking all the decisions on yourself. I'll ask them about the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. Why they're continuing it? Uh, could you please lower the gas prices? About it. I would uh, tell the president to get us back to our Christian heritage where this country started. Please always remain true, tell the truth, and uh, you can't go wrong. Help us out. After four years, uh, see some change. That we want health care and not insurance companies. We want Medicare for everyone in this country. I'd say the one thing that should be really on this main agenda is making sure that the planet is self-sustaining and that we can continue to live on this planet as human beings. Mr. President, when our country called me and my unit to serve in Iraq and Afghanistan, she depended on us and we serve proudly. We now depend on you to make the right moral choices for our country and its defenders. Good morning, everybody. How are you this morning? Good to see you here today. So what would, uh, what would a letter from you to the United States President look like? What, what would you say? How many of you think you've got something to say? Let me see your hand. Yeah, well, we're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about that in light of uh, what the Bible has to say. And uh, I'm really excited that you're here this morning. Uh, I, I want to do a couple of things. First of all, I want to give you a big, 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 huge shout out and thank you. Uh, for stepping up to the plate. Now, we've been talking to you the last couple of weeks about vision. We've been giving you a sneak, sneak preview of what's coming. Uh, we're going to be launching and announcing to you and kind of laying it all out before you uh, next month, beginning on October the 14th and running for five weeks. Uh, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about the vision that God has given us for 2013. We're very excited about it. Uh, what we know and what we believe is that this is what God wants for this church. And what we're trying to do is follow his lead. How many of you know, if you want to be a good leader, you got to first be a good follower. And so we're trying our best to follow the leadership of the Lord and to do what he wants, when he wants, and how he wants it. Because how many of you know God knows best? That God knows what we need. And God knows what it's going to take to turn our lives around in the direction that he wants them to go. And he knows what it's going to take to reach our communities. So we, I cannot tell you how pumped we are. Uh, and so uh, that, that's coming. But you guys stepped up to the plate last week. Uh, we uh, talked about Gideon and the 300. And last week, uh, we asked for 30 people to step up and uh, to uh, be disciple makers. Hands on making disciples uh, of people who want to go deeper with Christ. And we asked for 30, and I think we got 28. That was pretty cool. And uh, so that, that's exciting. And then we, we asked for 300 prayer warriors. And uh, we haven't quite gotten there yet, but over a hundred of you stepped up last week and said, I'll pray. I'll be a prayer warrior. If you're here this morning, first of all, and you did not sign up for the one of these, maybe you weren't here last week, out in the lobby on that big long table as you're going out the main uh, entrance and exit is a card that looks like this. And it says, get into the 300 at the top. If you would like to be a prayer warrior, it's pretty simple. You put your name and information on your circle prayer warrior. If you would like to be a disciple maker, someone, this is a lot of responsibility, someone who is going to lead a group and help those who want to go deeper in the relationship with Christ do just that, then you put your information out and circle disciple maker. And right outside of the office doors, right here in the lobby, there's a little mailbox. If you would fill that out and drop it in there, then we'll get in touch with you. Now, if you're here this morning and you're a disciple maker, then you've already been interviewed or you are scheduled to be interviewed uh, because we want you to know what you're getting into and we want to make sure that you're ready to, for the task that is set before you. And if you're here this morning and you signed up to be a prayer warrior, I need you to raise your hand if you signed up last week to be a prayer warrior. Raise them high. Hold them up because our ushers, go ahead guys, are going to give you a prayer strategy. It's really simple. It's on a card like this. And this is 11 weeks of prayer strategy. This is how we need you to be praying for the next 11 weeks. Uh, starting on December the 2nd, running all the way through January the 10th, we're not going to do a weekly prayer emphasis. We're going to do a daily prayer emphasis. And uh, we're going to be praying for 40 days for an outpouring of God's Spirit, for a move of God in this church. But it starts with this. How many of you know that every crop starts with a seed? 
And every revival, every move of God starts with prayer. And so uh, if, you, if, uh, if you signed up, keep your hand up until you get one of these. If you didn't sign up, if you sign up today, we'll mail you one of these this week and get you started. Also, all of our prayer warriors, if you gave us your email address, then you'll be getting an email later today with more instructions and encouragement uh, along the lines of how to pray as, uh, as we march toward this vision that the Lord has rolled out. And so I, I'm, I'm excited. Thank you so much for partnering uh, with us and helping us make this happen. Well, you saw the video this morning, and uh, uh, really interesting what people have to say when you ask them the question, uh, if you were to write a letter to the next president of the United States, what would you say? I, I thought they covered a lot of a lot of interesting, a lot of really good bases there this morning. Now, I, I've, I've come to realize that there are two different people, uh, and there are two different kinds of people in this building this morning when it comes to politics. There, there are those of you who you absolutely cannot get enough of politics. I mean, you love to talk about it. You, you, you have red, white, blue underwear. I mean, you know what I'm saying. You, you're into this. I mean, you, you, you watch all the ads on television. You've got your favorite guy, and you're rooting for him. And, and you may have a bumper sticker or a button or both. Uh, you, you watch not just one of the conventions. You watch both of them because... You love politics, you love the debate, you love to listen, you love to talk about it. And then there's the other kind of people who are here this morning. And the truth is, you just wish it would all go away. Amen. Some of you are living for November the 6th, and some of you are living for November the 7th. Absolutely. Because you just want it to be over with. You think it would be just as, just as good if we just flipped the coin, because in your opinion, neither one of them is going to do a good job. So who cares? And, and because of that, listen to me, some of you are passionate, you would not vote. I mean, to you, it's, it's tantamount to breathing. And others of you that you could care less, you maybe choose not to vote. I, I pray that all of us will vote in this upcoming election. I pray that we will. Now, some of you are a little antsy because you're thinking, oh, my goodness, Pastor Mike is getting political on us. Well, just hold your horses, okay? Uh, don't let them run away. You just hang on. Well, we're going to talk about this whole idea of the next president in, in the framework of the Bible. Uh, I am not a real political person. Now, uh, I vote. I think it's my, my right and my opportunity and my responsibility as a citizen of the United States to cast a vote. And, and, and listen, I ain't got no business complaining if I'm not voting. How many of you understand? That's my responsibility. But, but I'm not like, oh, you know, just crazy, over-the-top political. The last church I pastored, I, before I even officially took the, the position, I went down for a, a, a debriefing of the former pastor. We spent two days together, and, and he kind of uh, briefed me on where the church was and where it had come from, and kind of a handoff. I did the same thing with Pastor Wade here, only we did it all over a very fattening meal at the Cracker Barrel. Absolutely. It was awesome. But... Uh, um, uh, the pastor there invited uh, a lady from the community who happened to be a reporter for the newspaper. He invited her to come to lunch with us. And, and when I got there, he said, you're going to get interviewed today. They're going to write an article in the newspaper about you. You know, and he's patting me on the back. And I'm going, oh, brother, seriously? I mean, yeah, I, I, I'm not into this. I, I don't want to do this. He said, no, it's okay. She's a nice lady. I said, okay, that's cool. So she joined us for lunch, and then we're sitting there, and, and we finished our lunch, and when we got done, she took out her pad and her pen, and she said, Pastor, I'd like to interview you for the newspaper. I said, okay, go right ahead. She said, I, I, I've really only got a couple of questions. It won't take very long. I said, that's great. She said, uh, she asked me, you know, where I was from, all that stuff. And then she looked at me, and she said, now, Pastor Mike, I'd like to ask you, where do you stand politically? And she got that paper up and got that pen ready. And I said, well, ma'am, I, I, that's easy. That's an easy question. I can tell you where I stand politically. I, 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 she said, I want to know who you would like to vote for. And I said, I, I can tell you. I said, get ready to write down his name. Let me spell it for you. It's J-E-S-U-S-C-H-R-I-S-T. She said, he's not running for president. I said, he should be. Should be. This was, this was prior to his right out against an election. Um, back in 2000. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm sitting there and she said, I want you to get serious with me. I said, I am serious with you. She said, no, come on. She said, she said, the former pastor of this church is very political and I think you, you should be too. And so tell me, where do you stand? And I said, ma'am, I said, it is not my job to get somebody elected. 
I said, they have millions of dollars. They can buy TV ads. My job is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is what I do. I, I had a great lunch that day, but I had a bad reporter. I mean, you know, she, I don't think she published anything. She was so upset with me. But can I tell you something? I am not real overtly political, but I want you to know that we have a responsibility as citizens of this great land of ours. And, and, and someday, listen to me, we're going to stand before God accountable for what we did or we didn't do with the freedom that God gave us. Now, as we start this series this morning, I, I, I kind of want to uh, I want to focus on what it would look like if we sat down and wrote a letter to the next president of the United States. We don't know who that's going to be. It, it might turn out to be Mitt Romney. It might turn out to be Barack Obama. We don't know. Uh, we're, we're not to November the 6th yet. But, but when we get there and when it's finally determined, if we sat down and wrote a letter to the next president, what would it look like? I'm real curious. In the last service, I only had three people who had done this. In the Saturday night service, I had zero. I'm just wondering, how many of you have ever written a letter to the President of the United States? Can I see your hands if you've done that? One, two, three, four, five. Wow, that is so cool. I'm, I'm so proud of you. I, I'd like to see a copy of that if I could. That would be absolutely awesome. I, I actually was kind of bold a little way. I did a little bit of research and I found out that the White House gets about 10,000 letters a month addressed to the President of the United States of America. That's not counting the emails and faxes. Like that's, that's pretty over the top. That's a lot. It's a big, huge volume of mail. Kind of sounds like my, my junk mail load at the house. I mean, it's crazy. And then I also found out that uh, our sitting president right now actually reads a uh, ten of those letters a day and tries to respond to those ten letters uh, by hand every night. I did the math on that, and that's uh, over 3,600 handwritten letters a year. And I thought he's going to need wrist surgery when it's over. Amen. I'm like, dude, I don't write that many letters. I was quite impressed with that. The truth is, most of us will never take the time to write a sitting president of the United States. And here's why. Number one, we don't believe that it would ever reach his desk. We think somebody else would read it and shuffle it off the buffalo. Well, it would never be read by the president. And secondly, we don't believe if he did read it, it would make any difference at all. Well, I want to challenge your thinking on this because when I read the scriptures, here's what I find. Over and over and over and over. There's actually a pattern in the Old Testament. Over and over and over. Common, ordinary people were called upon to give advice to the President of the United States. Or not the United States, of Israel or Babylon. I, 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 I'm getting it all tied up there, aren't I? Amen. Uh, the truth is, we have an opportunity. We have a responsibility. And I think that, that we might have something to say. Now, even though you may or may not be political, how many of you think you might know something that you could say that would help them figure things out? Let me see your hands if you think you've got an idea to. Well, there's a lot of hands up right there. You see, some of you say, well, you just need to fix the economy, or you need to come up with some more jobs, or, or you need a new hairdo. I mean, you would have something to, to say, and, and that's cool. I, I want us to dive in. Go with me to Daniel chapter 4, if you would. And as you're turning there, before we start reading, let me give you a little bit of uh, background about this story we're going to look at. It happens in the year 580 B.C. And this story takes place during a time in the history of Israel when they are in captivity. Now here's what happened. God wanted them uh, that, that, to follow Him, but they chose not to. They, they were always doing their own thing, going their own way. And God said to them, He warned them, if you do not follow my ways and keep my commandments, here's what's going to happen to you, Israel. I'm going to pass judgment on you, and I'm going to allow foreign entities, foreign powers, foreign kings to come in, and they're going to overthrow you, and they're going to take you captive, and you're going to have to live as a slave to another nation for 70 years. Well, we know the story. Israel was a lot like us. They're hard-headed. They went their own way. They did their own thing. They did not obey God. They did not follow His ways. And so shortly after that, God sent the nation, the kingdom of Babylon, and the nation of Israel was overthrown. And when we pick up in this story, Israel is actually captive uh, in, the, in the kingdom of Babylon. And so basically, in that given time, the people have, have, have thought to themselves, if you were alive during this particular period in history, here's what you would have thought. You would have thought that the God of Israel must have gone out of business. Because the truth is that there was no stronger, more 
invincible group of people than the Hebrew children. I mean, you were here last week. We talked about uh, Gideon and the 300 men defeated 135,000 Midianites. I mean, come on. That's strategy. That's, that's superiority. That's amazing. And the reason they always won was because God was with them. But when they chose to go against God, God said, here's your punishment. You're going to lose Israel and you're going to be captives. And sure enough, it happened. And so basically people are thinking the God of Israel has gone out of business. Now in the nation of Babylon, and this was the strongest, most mightiest kingdom in this age. They, they, they worshiped a God by the name of Marduk. And everyone in that time period thought that Marduk must be this incredible, superior God. Because everywhere the Babylonians went, they won. If they decided to take over a nation, they did it. And they even defeated the mighty nation of Israel. And, and so when Israel falls to the Babylonians, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a difficult time uh, for, the, for the Jewish people. Now, the temple had been destroyed. It was looted. Uh, the walls of Jerusalem had been destroyed. And Israel literally is lying in ruins. And the man behind it all, the man who had conquered them, the man who had overthrown them, his name was King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, what we know about Nebuchadnezzar is he was a very brilliant king, an incredible leader. Here's what we know. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar was widely known for doing something that no other king, no other monarch would do. As a matter of fact, this would never happen in the United States of America. I don't think it would happen in any known world power. But it happened in King Nebuchadnezzar's reign. Whenever he went into a nation and overthrew them and destroyed them, here's what he would do. He would go through the people and he would hand pick out of the people he was taking captive the brightest and the best and the most talented. So in other words, if you were an incredible mathematician, Nebuchadnezzar would say, I have a job for you. If you were a scientist that, that was so smart and so brilliant, Nebuchadnezzar would say, glad to have you aboard. I mean, he was all about picking people, uh, even from these foreign nations. He was more interested in surrounding himself with the best and the brightest than he was just surrounding himself uh, with more Babylonians. And, and I don't know whether you think that's a pretty good leadership idea or not, but I, I think it was pretty smart. Uh, so so he, he had the most talented and the best equipped kingdom known to man. Now, when he conquered the nation of Israel and he brought them captive to Babylon, he brought out of Israel the best and the brightest to work in his kingdom. And this is how we know about four Hebrew boys that I know that you've heard of before. How many of you have heard of Daniel? Let me see your hands if you've heard of a guy named Daniel. How many of you have heard of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Well, those four Hebrew boys were some of the best and the brightest that Israel had to offer. And so when King Nebuchadnezzar overthrew Israel and took them captive, he brought those four boys, along with many others, into his kingdom. Now, an interesting fact about the, the, the kingdom of Babylon, in the city of Babylon in particular, if you were to find its geographical location today, it is geographically located in a nation called Iraq. How many of you have heard of that place? As a matter of fact, I saw a documentary several years ago, and if you want to look it up something interesting, it's pretty interesting. Saddam Hussein had decided that he was going to recreate the city of Babylon, and he actually tried to rebuild it, and, uh, uh, and, and we know how that turned out. He, he didn't turn out to be the second Nebuchadnezzar, and, and, and I imagine that city is lying in ruins today. But in the middle of King Nebuchadnezzar's rule, in the middle, right smack dab in the middle of his success and his fame, King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream that changes everything. And I want you to go with me to Daniel chapter 4, verse 4. And uh, we'll pick up right there. Uh, this is Nebuchadnezzar actually writing here. It's, it's as if, in the book of Daniel, it's as if we have a, a page or two out of the personal diary or the personal journal of this great king, Nebuchadnezzar. So interesting stuff here. Verse 4. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in my palace, contented and prosperous. How many of you would like to be at home in your palace, contented and prosperous? Yeah, it sounds like a pretty good life, huh? But then look at verse 5. He said, I had a dream that made me afraid as I was lying in my bed. 
the images and the visions that passed through my mind terrified me. How many of you have ever had a nightmare? How many of you have ever had a really bad dream? I mean, you wake up in a cold sweat and, and you're just, you know, you're just kind of breathing heavy and you're kind of all messed up or maybe you just scream out in the middle of the night and, 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 and your, your spouse hits you in the mouth and says, go back to sleep. Amen. And it'd be kind of rough. Yeah, but if you've ever had a bad dream, you know he's, he's having a bad one. Only this one isn't just a bad one. This is a bad, 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 bad one. And as a matter of fact, he doesn't even have a clue how bad it really is. Look at verse 10. Here's the dream he had. These are the visions I saw while lying in my bed. I looked, and there before me stood a tree in the middle of the land. Its height was enormous. The tree grew large and strong, and its top touched the sky. It was visible to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were beautiful, its fruit abundant, and on it was food for all. Under it, the beasts of the field found shelter, and the birds of the air lived in its branches. From it, every creature was fed. In the visions I saw while lying in my bed, I looked, and there before me was a messenger, a holy one, coming down from heaven. He called in a loud voice, cut down the tree, and trim off its branches, strip off its leaves, and scatter its fruit. Let the animals flee from under it, and the birds from its branches, but let the stump and its roots bound with iron and bronze remain in the ground in the grass of the field. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven and let him live with the animals among the plants of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man and let him be given the mind of an animal till seven times pass by for him. The decision is announced by messengers. The holy ones declare the verdict. So, watch this, so that the living may know that the most holy is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes and sets over them the lowliest of men. Now this was quite a proclamation that, that Nebuchadnezzar heard in this dream that he had. And it, it was quite upsetting to him. And I'll tell you why. Because he considered himself to be about as high as you could get. I mean, he was the king. He wasn't just any king. He is the king of the mightiest, the strongest, the biggest empire known to man. And, and so this was a little upsetting to him. He wakes up from the dream. He calls in all of his smart guys, his astrologers, his discerners, his dream interpreters. And he brings them in. And he says, I want an interpretation of this dream. And as they listen, none of them can tell him what it means. They go, you know, King, that's an uh, that's, uh, interesting dream. Big tree, animals, uh, And so finally, word gets to a man named Daniel. Now I believe that Daniel had been chosen. He was handpicked by Nebuchadnezzar or some of his advisors because Daniel was a man that had a different spirit about him. Uh, we'll find out later in the story that it said of him he had the spirit of God in him. Uh, he was a man after God's heart. How many of you remember Daniel and the lion's den? In there all night long and the lions didn't need him. This boy had something going for him. I mean, he had wisdom. He had a connection with God. And it showed in his life. Oh, to God, that the connection that we have with God through Jesus Christ would start showing up in our life. That people would take notice and look at us and say, man, you got something going on. Daniel had something going on. So word gets to him and they bring Daniel to King Nebuchadnezzar to inter interpret the dream. So Daniel listens to the dream and then he says, look at verse 19. Then Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, was greatly perplexed for a time and his thoughts terrified him. Um, look down at verse 20. The tree you saw, which grew large and strong with its top touching the sky, visible to the whole earth, with beautiful leaves and abundant fruit, providing food for all, giving shelter to the beasts of the field, and having nesting places in its branches for the birds of the air. You, O king, are that tree. And man, I can see old Nebuchadnezzar going, that's me. I'm just like a big oak tree. I mean, I, am, I touch the sky. I am so big, so huge. He says, you've become great and strong. Your greatness has grown until it reaches the sky. Your dominion extends to the distant parts of the earth. You, O oh king, saw a messenger, a holy one, coming down from heaven and saying, cut down the tree 
and destroy it. How many of you think right now, all of a sudden, Nebuchadnezzar's getting a lump in his throat? He's going, ah, wait a minute, I, I'm the tree. What's he talking about? Leave the stump bound with iron and bronze in the grass of the field while its roots remain in the ground. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let him live like the wild animals until seven times pass by for him. This is the interpretation, O king. And this is the decree the Most High has issued against my Lord the King. This is so powerful. I want you to see this. I love Daniel. I think he's one of the boldest people in the whole Word of God. Here he is, a slave, a captive in this nation of Babylon. He's standing in front of not just anybody but the King, King Nebuchadnezzar. And, and he basically says, Oh King, I just want you to know that you may be a big tree. You may touch the sky and the whole world may know who you are. But, oh, King, I want you to know that there is one that is most high. He is the most high God. He's higher than you. He's bigger than you. And then in verse 25, here's what he says. You will be driven away from people and will live like the wild animals. You'll eat grass like cattle and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge. Until you acknowledge. That the Most High, there it is again, hallelujah, the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and that He gives them to anyone He wishes. The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge, watch this, when you acknowledge, not that Babylon rules, not that King Nebi rules, but when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Therefore, he says, O okay, king, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that your prosperity will continue. Now, this was a huge blow to King Nebuchadnezzar's ego. How many of you know that most politicians have an ego? Come on now, folks. I, mean, I saw a commercial on TV the other day, and I just wanted to call a guy up and say, listen, why did you leave out walking on water? Because you should have put that in there, too. Because according to what you said, you, you're bound to walk on water. I mean, you're going to save us from everything. I mean, seriously, how many of you know ego gets in the way? Come on now, folks. And, 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 and it's hard to be. I mean, it's not impossible, but it's difficult to be a politician without being struck on yourself. How many of you understand this? And, and, and King Nebuchadnezzar, come on now, he was totally struck on himself. And uh, this could have gone really wrong for Daniel. I mean, think about it. This great king could have said, you know what, Daniel? You know what? You know what I think about your interpretation? Take his head off right now. I mean, he could have done that. He had the power to do that. But the truth is, he only had power when God gave him power. And so basically, when Daniel stood before him, Daniel, let me just kind of break it down for you. Basically, what he was saying was, hey, king, you are not sovereign. You are not in control. Hey, 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 king, Nebuchadnezzar, oh, by the way, your God, Marduk, is no God at all. He's not in control, but my God, the Most High God, is the one who gives the kingdoms of the earth to whoever He wishes. And by the way, you, king, are about to face the judgment of the Most High God if you don't repent and renounce your sins. Wow, how about that for a letter to the next president? That sounds pretty good to me, huh? I think that's a pretty good start. What a bold statement of truth. He tells Nebuchadnezzar that, that God wants to make a point. You see, people were saying that the God of Israel was dead, that he had gone out of business. But Daniel said, I just want you to know today that he's not out of business and he's not dead and he's not biding his time. He wants you to know that the only reason that you were able to overthrow Israel is because he let you do it. And then Daniel tries to talk to Nebuchadnezzar and he tells him, he says, King, you're, you're arrogant. You strut around like you own the world. You're so arrogant. If you would just repent and renounce your sins and do what is right and make sure there's more justice in your kingdom and get rid of your wickedness by being kind to poor people and people who are oppressed. He said, listen, King, you can turn this thing around. It does not have to be this way. If you'll do the right thing, this bad dream may not become a reality. And what we know is this brilliant king this all-powerful potentate, you know what he did? Went stupid. That's what he did. 
because he decided not to listen to the advice of a man of God. And so what happened was, he just, I, I can hear him. He says, you know what, Daniel? I brought you out of Israel. I did that. And I gave you a job. And don't you forget that. And you're here today because of my pleasure. I invited you into the palace today. And I appreciate you coming by. Thank you so much for the interpretation. But you know what, Daniel? I mean, seriously. I'm going to eat grass like a cow. I mean, come on. That's about the silliest thing I ever saw. I'm not eating grass. My steak is ready. And I'll see you later. I go home and uh, maybe you should eat some grass. And he marches out of the room. Now, I want you to go with me, if you would, to verse 29. He lived this arrogant pride-filled lifestyle for another year. God let him go for another year. How I many of you know God will always give space for repentance? He'll always give you a chance to get things right. God will warn you, and He'll warn you, and He'll warn you, but, and, and, but finally, the day of judgment's coming. Twelve months later, verse 29, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, is this not, is not this the great Babylon I have built, the royal residence, by my mighty power, and for the glory of my majesty. Let me kind of break that down for you. Here he is, President Nebuchadnezzar. He's up on the top of the White House in Babylon. And he's strutting his stuff. I mean, you know, I mean he's, he's strutting. He goes, listen, am I hot or what? I mean, come on. I mean, just look at me. I mean, just look at my kingdom. Look at this palace. I mean, ain't no man alive got it better than I've got it. And, and you know who I have to thank? Thank you. Thank you so much. I have myself to thank. Because I worked so hard. And I fought so hard. And I'm such a good organizer. And, and I'm so brilliant. I bring all of these smart people from all these nations I conquer. And just look at what I've done. I mean, just look at what I've done. Verse 31. The words were still on his lips when a voice came from heaven. Now, there's a handful of times in Scripture where God leaned over the balcony and said, uh, testing one, two, three. Do I have your attention? And this is one of them. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. And I can see old Nebi. He's taken back at the voice. But then he's going, wait a minute. Who's using a loudspeaker system? We haven't even invented that yet. What's going on here? He says, I don't know who you are or how you're doing this, but I just want you to know you can't take this from me. I earned this for myself. I did this myself. And you know what God is saying? God is saying, Nebuchadnezzar, you're wrong. You didn't do this. You are the king over Babylon only because I allowed you to be. And I want to give you the first leadership truth that you need. You'll see up on the screen. Nebuchadnezzar is confronted with the truth. Watch this. That leadership is a stewardship. I said leadership is a stewardship, which simply means it is given to you to watch over. It is not yours. You don't own it. But it is given to you. The right to lead, the role to lead, the position of leadership has been given to you. People who have a position or a place of leadership have that position or place only because God has allowed them to have it and to function in that role as a leader. Listen, it is only by the grace of God. I don't care whether you're the president of the United States or you're a congressman or are you the guy in charge of bus tickets or are you the boss on your job or you're a team leader and a supervisor or you're a family man or a mom or a dad. That position of leadership has been given to you by God. And listen to me, someday you're going to answer for it. Now, God wanted Nebuchadnezzar to know what He wants all leaders to know. And, and that is, He is the one, God is the one, the only one who gives the positions away. Look at verses 32 and 33. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You'll eat grass like cattle. Seven times will pass for you. Let me just pause here for a second. It's not known. We don't have a definitive uh, of what this means, seven times. Most theologians and scholars believe it meant seven years. It could be seven years, it could be seven months, it could be seven weeks, it could be seven days. I don't think it's seven days. It would take a lot longer than seven days to get the pride out of this old boy. I, I think I agree with the theologians. I believe it's more like seven years or whatever. Seven times will pass 
satisfy for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives to them anyone He wishes. Look at verse 33. Immediately, what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people and he ate grass like cattle. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. Now, what happened here? Well, very simply, immediately, the boy went crazy. How many of you understand this? Insanity in a second. His officials came in and discovered him on the ground eating grass like a cow. And this is, this is, this is horrible. I mean, I, how many of you glad this hasn't happened to you? I hope it doesn't. Amen. I mean, one minute he's, he's up on top of the White House strutting and surveying his kingdom. And one second later, he's ripped off his clothes. He's making strange snorting sounds. And he's galloping on all fours. He's running through the streets of Babylon and raving mad. I don't want to tell you, he, he lost it. Now, I love theologians and scholars and people who write commentaries, but sometimes they just, they just need to go right back to the Word. And one commentator said, well, we figured out what happened to him. He had a nervous breakdown. <laughs> I've been close a few times. I hope I never go that far. Amen. I think something worse than a nervous breakdown happened. One, one guy wrote, he was afflicted with lycanthropy, a strange condition where a person thinks he's a wolf. <laughs> he watches sci-fi TV too much. Amen. Another guy wrote, more likely, it was boanthropy, the condition where a person thinks he's a cow or a bull. Well, I don't know what you would call the malady that he got. I just know where it came from. God inflicted it on him as judgment. God allowed it to come on him. And the bottom line is, he went stark raving mad. Now, there's no way to keep the king's malady totally hidden from the public for seven years. Sooner or later, probably sooner, it's going to leak out. And though he was still the king, he couldn't reign, he couldn't speak, he couldn't appear in public. I mean, can you imagine uh, today, uh, hi, I am King Nebuchadnezzar's press secretary, and I just wanted to let you know that the press conference today has been canceled. Uh, the king seems to have eaten something that didn't agree with him, and so he's not going to be able to make the engagement today. My apologies. I'm sorry. Or they could say, here he is, his highness, King Nebuchadnezzar. And he could come out and go, you got any good grass in your backyard? I don't know. I mean, it was bad. And you didn't want this to get out because if it got out, watch this. The nations who wanted to defeat Babylon, they would go, hey, here's our chance. I mean, the smart guy over there who planned all this stuff, he's going to start raving mad. So why don't we go take it now? But what we do know is over time, the story of this insanity began to leak out. And apparently, uh, he himself, Nebuchadnezzar, told this story later in his life. But look at verse 34. The story continues. At the end of that time, and this is seven years or seven months, whatever it was. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven. And my sanity was restored. Can I stop right there for just a second? Some of you are on the edge of insanity. And, and let me tell you what part of the problem is. Part of the problem is pride. Let me tell you one of the greatest problems in the United States of America. We are way too full of ourselves. We are way too pumped up and arrogant in ourselves. What we need is more of God and less of us. Can I just say to you that pride is a form of spiritual insanity. And pride is claiming credit for ourselves. The credit that belongs to God alone. And Nebuchadnezzar says, I raised my eyes towards heaven. And my sanity was in store. Then I praise the Most High. He's calling him. Look, he's calling him the Most High. I praise the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever and ever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? Wow. What a turnaround. Amen. I pray to God that none of you have to be eating grass to get a turnaround like that. You see, the, 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 the neat thing here is it was a horrible, horrible punishment he had to go through. But look at what he did. 
Verse 36. At the same time, my sanity was restored. My honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out. And I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. But look at verse 37. He cannot stop praising God. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify. Not once, not twice, three times. I praise. I exalt. I glorify. Watch this. The King of Heaven. Because everything He does is right and all His ways are just. And those who walk in pride, He is able to humble. And if you don't believe that, He says, just ask me. I can, I can, I can tell you a story. That's remarkable. We could stop right here and say, you know what? This is great. And they lived happily ever after. But that's not the end of the story. That, that's the amazing part. Eventually, King Nebuchadnezzar dies. And the kingdom is passed on to his son. Now, as time passes, the influence and the power of the kingdom of Babylon has begun to grow weaker and weaker. Listen to me. When there is weakness in leadership, there is weakness in influence. When there is weakness in leadership, there is weakness in effectiveness. When there is weakness in leadership, then, then the nation suffers, and they started suffering. There was a new group called the Medes and the Persians who began to encroach on the Babylonian kingdom. And Nebuchadnezzar's son had to fight many battles with them as they were trying to take over. And little by little, they were chewing away at the kingdom of Babylon. About halfway through his son's reign, his son decided to retire. Now, now this is unheard of. As a matter of fact, I don't think there's another case in, ancient, in the ancient world of a king who retired. Kings don't retire. I mean, you know, queens don't retire. Just ask Queen Elizabeth. She ain't going nowhere. But she, she's, just, she's just still cooking, you know. She's still going, you know. Kings don't retire. They either are killed in battle or they die of old age sitting on the throne. But his son decided to retire. And it gets even stranger. We, we know from reading history and scripture that his son went off and joined a religious cult. Last time we heard from him, he was in New York City with a bandana around his head selling flowers. And he turned his kingdom over to Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. His name was Belshazzar. Now the kingdom is now in the hands of Belshazzar, the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. And like his granddad, unfortunately, he got his granddaddy's genes. He's ruling Babylon with arrogance and pride, even though his kingdom is being eaten away by the Persians and the Medes. And then an amazing event takes place. And we actually know the exact date because of history. We know the exact date that this took place. On our calendar, October the 12th, 538 B.C., the, the Persians and the Medes who were trying to, 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 to take the nation of the kingdom of Babylon arrived at the outskirts of Babylon and surrounded the city. They laid siege to it and they said, we're going to stay here until it's overthrown. Now inside of Babylon on October the 12th, 538 B.C. is Belshazzar and all of his attendants and all of his army, all of his nobles. He's so confident that the Persians under the leadership of King Cyrus and the Medes under the leadership of King Darius are not going to be able to overthrow this great city of Babylon that on the evening of October the 12th, he threw the biggest party that had ever been thrown in Babylon. And so, so basically what he was saying was, by throwing this party, he said, he said, you Persians and you Medes who are outside the city limits of Babylon, Listen to me, you can just sit out there and rock in your tents because you're not coming in here. We have plenty of food. We have the river Euphrates runs right through the middle of, of, of the city. And we've got all that we need. And you're not going to be able to overthrow us. And, and to put the cherry on top, we're going to throw a party. You can rot in your tent tonight. We're going to throw a party. And he does. They, they go into the palace where this big statue of Marduk is, this god that they worship, huge statue. And, and to, to, to add insult to injury, Belshazzar says, I want you to go down. I want you to go down to the treasury. And I want you to dig out all of the idols and all of the statues from all of the nations that have been defeated by the great Babylon. All those nations that my granddaddy Nebuchadnezzar defeated, all those nations that we have defeated, I want you to go down there and get them. And they brought them back. And there was plenty of them. There were little idols, little statues that represented the gods of all the nations that they had, they had engulfed and overthrown. And they set them alongside of this big statue of Marduk. 
It was as if to say, our God is big and your gods are small. Now, as they're digging through the treasury, they're looking, they're trying to find the idols and the statues that represent Yahweh, who is the God of the Hebrews. But to their disappointment, they can't find any. There, there's no statues. There's no idols. They can't find anything. Uh, all they can find is eating utensils, plates, and goblets. And so they bring those back and they say, King, there's, there's no idols, there's no statues. Now, why wasn't there any idols or statues? Because the first commandment says, Thou shalt have no other God be for me. That God had said, No graven images, no idols. And the Hebrews, even though they had disobeyed God in so many other ways, there were none. And so they brought these things back. And when they brought them back, basically, Belshazzar said, This is great. Bring those goblets over here, all these gold elements. And he says, We will drink wine out of those goblets. And so the goblets from the holy temple of God is now being filled with the, the slur of, of, of Babylon. And he's drinking and he's throwing this party and he, he's living it up. And I mean the music is going and, and the liquor is flowing. And all of a sudden, a hand appears and begins to write on the wall. Go to Daniel chapter 5 verse 5. Suddenly, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale and he was so frightened that his knees knocked together and his legs gave way. The king called out for the enchanters, astrologers, and diviners to be brought and said to these wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and tells me what it means will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around his neck and he'll be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. And then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or tell the king what it meant. So King Belshazzar became even more terrified and his face grew more pale. His nobles were, were back. Now let me just stop there and relate the rest of the story to you. His, his wife comes in, the queen. And she says to the king, she says, oh, king, live forever. And she says, honey, you're looking awful pale. And do you need some blush on those cheeks of yours? I mean, they just stop being so, what are you so afraid of? She says, do I need to remind you that when your grandfather ruled, there was a man in his kingdom named Daniel. And Daniel was a man who, who was found to have a keen mind. He had knowledge. He had understanding. He could interpret dreams. He, he could explain riddles. He could solve difficult problems. And she said, call for Daniel, and he will, he will be able to understand it. And he'll be able to tell you what it says. So Daniel was brought in. And the king asked him, are you Daniel? And he says, yes, I, I am Daniel. And he, he tells him, my wise men have looked at this, but they can't read it. And, and the king says, if you'll read this, if you'll tell me what it says, I'll give you a purple robe, I'll give you, I'll give you a gold chain. Listen, I'll give you an iPhone 5 if you'll read that right there. Okay? Brand new iPad too. Just all you gotta do is read it. If you just read it, tell me what it says. I'll give you all this stuff. And, and, and Daniel looks up at the wall and he instantly reads it. And he looks at the king and he says, You may keep your gifts for yourself and give your rewards to somebody else. He had also been promised the third place in the kingdom. And I can hear Daniel saying, I don't want to be 300th in your kingdom, dude. I mean, seriously, your kingdom's about to come to an end. I don't need any of that stuff. But I tell you what, you call me down here, I'll go ahead and read it for you. Okay. The Most High God gave your father Nebuchadnezzar sovereignty, power, greatness, glory, and splendor. Because of the high position he gave him, all of the peoples and the nations and the men of every language dreaded and feared him. Those the king wanted put to death, he put to death. Those he wanted to spare, he spared. Those he wanted to promote, he promoted. And those he wanted to humble, he humbled. But when his heart became arrogant and hardened with pride, he was deposed from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. He was driven away from people, given the mind of an animal, lived with wild donkeys, ate grass like cattle. Look at verse 22. But you, his son, his grandson, old Belshazzar, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all of this. Let's stop there for a second. Can I just say that Belshazzar didn't need to hear that story he already had heard it. I believe on the knee of his granddad he heard that story. I believe his family history bore it out, the history of Babylon bore it out. He knew this. Look at verse 23. Instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You had the goblets from his temple brought to you 
And you and your nobles, your wives, your concubines drink wine from him. You praise the gods of silver and gold and bronze and iron and wood and stone, which cannot see, hear, or understand. But you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. Therefore, he sent the hand that wrote the inscription. And this is the inscription that was written. Many, many tekel parson. And these are what these words mean. Many. God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have weighed on the scales. You've been weighed on the scales and found wanting. And number 30, 20, verse 28, um, uh, Perez or, or, or Parson, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Now, while all of this was going on, let me tell you what was going on outside the city. The Persians and the Medes had, they had blocked the river Euphrates. They, they created a marsh. And what was going on was the water level was dropping inside of the city. And so when it dropped down far enough, their soldiers were able to squeeze in under that wall. And that night, October the 12th, 538 B.C., is recorded in history. Same night they had the party. Same night the handwriting was on the wall. Same night that it was declared, your kingdom is now finished. Same night the Bible says that, that the, the Medes and the Persians that very night, verse 30, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain. And Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. Now, as I bring this to a close this morning, what is the moral of the story? There's a, a couple of leadership lessons that I want you to learn. First of all, I already told you that leadership is stewardship. That's truth number one. Here's truth number two. Leadership is temporary. How many of you know this? Come on now, folks. I mean, these, these guys are running for president. And they're spending billions of dollars to get elected. For how long? Well, if Obama gets back in, he's got four more years. And that's it. He's done. He's toast. And if Romney gets elected, he's got four, or if he gets reelected, he'll have eight. At best, they get eight years. How many of you know that's temporary? Come on now, folks. How many of you know that your job is temporary? Someday you're going to get fired. Someday you're going to lose your job. Someday you're going to retire. Someday you're going to take another job. And the responsibility you've been given, listen to me, is temporary. It's a stewardship and it's temporary. Listen, you won't always have the influence over your children that you've got right now. It's temporary. And then there's one other leadership truth I want you to get. And that is, we are all accountable for our leadership. Every one of us is going to answer to God. Listen to me. I'm going to answer to God for what kind of husband I was. I'm going to answer to God for what kind of father I was. I'm going to answer to God for what kind of pastor I was. Are, are you listening to me? I, I'm going to stand before God. Barack Obama is going to answer to God for what kind of president he was. George W. Bush is going to answer to God for what kind of president he was. All the way back. Every leader, every leader is accountable to God. And the moral of this story is that the Most High God is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and He gives them temporarily to whoever He wishes and that all leadership is stewardship, which means it's temporary and we're always accountable to God. Yeah. Our nation has been blessed. I said our nation has been blessed. Amen. Even though we have been on a constant, non-stop <laughs> movement away from God, God continues to bless this nation called the United States. Blows my mind. Listen to me. This nation is not where it needs to be right now. I said this nation is not where it needs to be right now. The answer is not a slick politician. The answer is a move of Almighty God in our nation. say that you hold more power in some ways than the very President of the United States does because you can be a daily influence in the world that you live in and you've got Jesus Christ living in the center of your life. Would you please show this world what it's supposed to look like? We've had some brilliant presidents. We've had some presidents who've made some incredible decisions that led us in most difficult times. But I want to tell you, you can be brilliant. You can be a strategist. You can be the commander-in-chief of the greatest armed forces in the world. But the only way you become a great leader, the only way that you become a great leader, is when you raise your eyes to heaven 
and you acknowledge that God, the Most High God, is sovereign over all the kingdoms of men, and He chooses who leads for how long. That's the only time when a man can be called prayers. Now, I wish Daniel was here today to help us write a letter to the president, don't you? How many of you think he'd write a good one? I don't even think he'd mail it. I think he'd go there. <laughs> I got an envelope for the president. I know you can have it. I need to see him. I think he would be bold. You know, can I tell you something? I think every one of us in this room wants to sit down and write a letter after the election is over on November the 7th. I think it'll be our first line of duty that we write a president. Then you don't write him and say, Dear Mr. Scoundrel, I didn't vote for you and I wish nobody else had. That's going to help. How about saying, give him the respect that he's due? Hello? How many of you have ever had the president you voted for not get elected? Did I see your hands? Yeah, I, like I asked you, it's Saturday night service, nobody raised their hand. I'm like, what do y'all do, not vote? Or what's it? Now, even if the guy that you're not wanting to get in there gets in there, how many of you know he's still the president of the United States? Yeah. Do I need to remind you that you're going to be held accountable to God? For your respect and for the fact that you're supposed to be praying for him according to scripture. So if I was you, I'd be doing my part. And then whether he does his part or not, you better do your part. I think we all ought to write a letter saying, Dear Mr. President, I'm praying for you. You got a really difficult job. And sir, I think I just want to encourage you. Well, let me just read what maybe Daniel would have written. Dear Mr. President, while it is true that you are accountable to us, the American people. We are not the ones to whom you are ultimately accountable. And while it is true that you must answer to the Congress of the United States, sir, you are someday going to answer to the Most High God. And while you spend time over the next four years consulting with leaders from around the world, with business leaders and leaders of industry and your chosen team of advisors, my hope for you, Mr. President, is that you will take the time to consult with the creator of this world, the Most High God. And as the great King Nebuchadnezzar and his grandson Belshazzar were reminded, Sir, the Most High God is sovereign over the kingdoms of men, and He gives them to anyone He wishes. And you are President of these United States simply because God saw fit for you to be in that position. So, Mr. President, your leadership is a trusted stewardship that God is entrusting to you. It's only temporary, only for four at most eight years. And, sir, you, even you, are accountable to God. And you are assigned on the bottom. I'm praying for you. Look up. Amen. Look up. Are you listening to me, folks? I'm not talking about politicians who use the name of God when it's convenient. I'm not talking about politicians who just say, you know, I believe in God. I'm talking about a man, a woman, whoever the politician is that looks to God and acknowledges who He is. So, Pastor, what in the world has this got to do with me? Well, number one, I believe we need to be praying for our nation. We need to be praying for the election. And we need to be praying that our, our president and the leaders of our nation will turn back to God. And I believe we need to turn back to God. Are you listening to me? Even deeper than that, listen to me. If you're a dad, if you're a mom, if you're a granddad, if you're a grandma, if you're a boss, if you're a team leader, if you're a supervisor, if you're a school teacher, if you're a, if you're a lifeguard, if you're a coach, if you're a pastor, I don't care. Whoever it is that God is giving you charge over, the next time you catch yourself strutting over your kingdom, saying, look at me, look at what I've done, look at what I created, look at what I made, I want to encourage you to stop and look up to heaven and say, oh dear God, I just about lost it here. I'm, I'm looking at the wrong things. You didn't give me this position to lord over anybody. But God, you gave me this position to take care of these people. And someday I'm going to answer to you, Most High God. Would you give me the wisdom I need to be the kind of person you called me to be? If we'd lead like that, I think we'd have healthier children, healthier workers, 
better schools. Are you listening to me? It starts with us. I'm going to ask you to stand with me this morning if you would. We're going to have a, a time of prayer. Before I pray this morning, I want to ask, if you're here today and you don't know Christ Jesus as your Savior, listen, it all starts with a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You can't make a difference in your world by yourself. You know, when these great kings didn't know what to do, they brought in who? The man who had a connection with God. Not once, but twice. And can I tell you that because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary, and because God raised Him from the dead, that the veil has been torn in two. And you have direct access to God through Jesus Christ. And so, sir, you don't need a holy man. What you need is the King of kings and the Lord of lords to sit on the throne of your heart. His name is Jesus. And so this morning, you need to dethrone yourself. And you need to reside as the king of your world. And you need to ask Jesus Christ to take control, full control of your life. He stands ready to do that. And after I'm through praying, I'm going to be right down front here. And if you don't know Jesus Christ... I want to invite you to come down here, and I want to pray with you. I want to introduce you. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And He wants to reign in your world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank You and I praise You today, Lord, that You brought us here. And I thank You, Father, for this truth, this story, God, this monumental, epic, Lord, story of Your intervention in the times of man. I thank you, Father God, that you are the same, most high God, today that you were then. And today, Lord, it is still true of you. That, Lord, you are sovereign over all of the kingdoms of this earth, including the United States of America. And you give the thrones, you give the presidencies, you give the seats of power to those whom you choose. Because you, O oh God, are the sovereign. And so, Lord, we bow our hearts and our knees to you and we ask you humbly that you would intervene in our nation. We pray, God, just as you moved in this nation, just, God, as you turned this leader around, we pray you would move in our nation and that our leaders would be men and women of God. We pray, Father, for an awakening in this land called the United States of America. Lord, that once was the greatest bastion, not only of freedom, but of the, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. May we once again be that shining light in a dark world. God, I pray for revival and renewal and awakening in this nation of ours. But God, I know it doesn't start with the president. It starts with us. And so I ask you today to convict our hearts. I ask you today to call us to repentance, to call us to a place of renouncing our sins, to call us to a place, Lord, of acknowledging that you have put us in whatever place that we are and that we are accountable to you. It's a stewardship, God. And Lord, we've got to bow the knee to you. Help us, Father, to be the best leaders we can be, the best fathers, the best husbands, the best moms, the best wives, the best bosses, the best supervisors, the best coaches, teachers, whatever we are, Father. Help us, Lord, to live it out for a world that desperately needs to see that you truly, God, are the most high God who is in control. And we ask all of this in the name that is above every name, the name of the King of kings and the Lord of lords, in the name, the strong name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And everyone said, Amen. 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 So look, look, at, look at your neighbor and look at him. And say, listen, it's time to be like Daniel. Tell him, it's time to be like Daniel. Amen. Go home and start crafting your letter to the next president. And let God lead you. And go home and start being a leader. If you don't know Christ, would you join me down front right here? I'd love to pray with you and introduce you to my best friend. He'll change your life. God bless you.